Hello, my name is Henry Silverman, and today I would like to talk about research on store tissue samples. What are the ethical issues? Well, ethical issues uh, that occurs in other biomedical research also concerns itself with um, research regarding stored samples. We have issues about informed consent, risks, mainly due to um, issues about privacy and breaches of confidentiality, and issues regarding IRB review. However, stored tissue samples, especially with gen genetic research, um, were not um, areas of um, concern when the uh, regulations were first um, uh, developed in 1979. And if we fast forward, to um, uh, today, we see that there are additional ethical issues that we need to consider. So uh, essentially, there are old themes that need to be applied to new dimensions of um, uh, genetic research. So for example, for informed consent, we need to consider what is necessary for a valid informed consent for the future use of samples for unspecified research. We also need to um, consider about obtaining informed consent for samples that have been archived. Uh, and, and we need to address the issue of whether informed consent could be waived for archived or existing samples. Then, um, for sure, the risk of genetic research does involve privacy and confidentiality issues. But even if samples are de-identified, even under the regulations, we have research that is not considered human subject research because the samples have been de-identified, we still need to deal with the issue of community harms, and we'll give an example of that in just a few minutes. And then with regarding IRB review, uh, we need to consider what additional elements of informed consent is needed for genetic research. And then other issues that we need to consider is whether and how do we disclose research results to participants? And who actually owns these samples? Because these, uh, this issue has implications for um, commercial um, um, prospects. This slide shows the terms we use for the type of samples that are collected. Um, first, um, we, we consider slides to be anonymous if no personal identifiers had been obtained at the time of collection, we call samples anonymized if personal identifiers are re completely removed when recorded by the researcher. We call the samples coded if there are still links to personal identifiers. And then, of course, samples are identified if the personal identifiers are still it. This slide reviews the U.S. regulations regarding human subject research. We are doing human subject research if the samples contain identifiable information, in which case all the regulations apply to this type of research. However, there are certain uh, conditions in which one is considered not to be doing human subject research, and that falls under um, two separate categories. One, if the samples are anonymous, it's not considered human subject research because we don't have any identifiers. Um, second, um, research on anonymized samples by researchers who do not have access to the code. And th this would occur in the existence of a non-disclosure use agreement with investigators who collected the samples. So essentially, if uh, I collected the samples and I give these samples to another group of investigators, and the samples have been anonymized, in other words, de-identified, and I have a non-disclosure agreement with those investigators, those investigators are considered be, to be doing non-human subject research. OHRP, the Office of Human Research Protection, also um, have guidance regarding this issue. OHRP does not consider research involving coded private information or specimens to involve human subjects under a regulatory definition of human subjects if the following conditions are both met. 
One, the private information or specimens were not collected specifically for the currently proposed research project through an interaction or intervention with living individuals, and the investigators cannot readily ascertain the identity of the individuals to whom coded private information or specimens pertain because the key to decipher the code has been destroyed before the research begins, and hence you can access the identifiers. Or the investigators and the holder of the key enter into an agreement prohibiting the release of the key to the investigators under any circumstances. This is similar to what I just mentioned before in the previous slide. Um, or there are IRB approved written policies and operating procedures for a repository or data management center that prohibit the release of the key to the investigators under any circumstances. Or there are legal requirements prohibiting the release of the key to the investigators. Regarding this last point, so for example, if I obtain blood samples from the Red Cross, uh, the Red Cross is under a legal um, mandate not to release uh, personal identifiers to me. So if I get samples from the Red Cross, then my IRB, IRB should consider me not doing human subjects research. So uh, this slide shows a landscape um, for informed consent regarding existing samples. Um, um, first, if um, if previous informed consent for a specific genetic research has been obtained, then this such situation is relatively unproblematic. However, if previous informed consent to a current specific project had not been obtained, um, for example, the samples were previously collected for clinical purposes, and the identifiers remain, or if they were collected for another research and the identifiers remain, essentially informed consent has not been obtained for the current research project. And so what are the choices available in order to do this research? Well, one, the IRB could request the investigators to recontact all the donors to obtain informed consent. Um, second, the I, uh, IRB could, could um, say that the uh, samples need to be de-identified in which one is now doing non-human subject research and hence informed consent could be waived. However, that limits the value of the research. Um, or three, uh, the IRB could um, sanction the waiver of the informed consent um, with confidentiality procedures uh, Institute is such that the research could now be considered minimal risk. And the whole issue of waiver of informed consent, which we discussed in our previous module, um, is uh, discussed uh, in um, this paper that were um, handed out previously, when consent gets in the way. The next um, subject matter I want to talk about is um, potentially objectionable research uh, with um, uh, genetic research. And what I want to talk about now is harms to the community, even, even when the samples have been de-identified. So I'd like to tell you uh, the recent um, story uh, involving the Havasupai tribe versus the Arizona State University. Um, this slide shows where the um, Havasupai tribe uh, lived in the state of Arizona, which is uh, on the uh, reservation here, and they lived in this valley shown, shown in this slide. Um, and um, um, so uh, essentially this, um, this tribe could be considered, um, because of their um, uh, not intermingling with um, other members of society in, in the U.S., uh, their uh, genetic material was um, considered somewhat um, homogeneous. Um, now, uh, back um, in the um, 90s, um, it was noticed that their rate of diabetes were increasing among both women and men. 
And in 1989, members of the small tribe of um, approximately 650 poverty-stricken people approached the anthropology professor, um, John Martin, at Arizona State University uh, to see if he could figure out why the incidence of diabetes was uh, increasing in their community. If a genetic link could be located, it uh, might provide a tool for addressing risk factors. Martin enlisted the help of geneticist um, um, Therese Marco, whose previous, whose previous work also included other diseases, specifically schizophrenia, and hence wanted to expand the current study to include mental disorders as well. So the original study was supposed to uh, involve only diabetes, and approximately 100 tribal members signed a broad consent to study the causes of behavioral medical disorders. Uh, however, uh, most of the people who entered into the um, study um, were um, um, somewhat illiterate. Uh, English was a second language. All believed they were donating blood solely for the purpose of looking for this genetic link to diabetes. The uh, researchers at Arizona State University determined that a genetic link to di diabetes did not exist. However, unbeknownst to the um, original participants, they continued their research into medical dis um, disorders without obtaining additional consent for this additional research. Dr. Marco continued her mental disorder research based on the samples provided by the tribe. Also, other researchers at Arizona State University also utilized the samples for um, their work, which they um, published. And some of the investigators also did research investigating the origin and migration of the um, tribe from Asia. Essentially, 23 scientific uh, papers were um, published using these samples, and 15 of these papers focus on schizophrenia, inbreeding, and migration from Asia. So curiously enough, um, Coletta Tolusi, who was a member of the tribe, was invited one day to a seminar of one of Marco's graduate students in 2003. And she was at this seminar in which this graduate student was presenting the results of research one of the research um, using the um, samples from her tribe. And when she um, heard this, she became um, very upset, especially since the research was um, um, pertaining um, to the uh, migration history of, of her tribe. Um, and the, um, the Havasupai origin study is that the Grand Canyon was created um, for them as the waters receded from the global flood, and they had no understanding or no belief system that they had migrated from Asia. Essentially, Toulouse felt that the blood of her people had been used to challenge their identity and to refute their religion. Um, what happened next was that there was a lawsuit against Arizona State University, um, and the defendants included the investigators as well as the uh, university. After seven years of litigation, the Havasupai tribe settled in April of 2010. Terms of the uh, settlement involved a payment of $700,000, return of all the blood samples, and additional assistance, including scholarships and help in obtaining federal funding for a health, cl a health clinic. Lessons learned, even if individual samples are I anonymized or de-identified, there could be community harms. Informed consent for previously unspecified research is needed if such harms are greater than minimal risk and recontact is practicable. Uh, so these are issues for the IRB to consider. The next question is, um, uh, in addition to harms to communities, um, how anonymous are data when they have been um, be identified? So essentially, individuals um, could still be harmed, even if their samples are de-identified. And we're talking about in the context of genetic research. So 
Um, let me give you this example of what happened with the NIH. They were, um, had established a database of genotypes and phenotypes, and they were um, asking um, um, uh, researchers who had collected all their databases from their individual research studies to uh, contribute their database to one large repository um, at the NIH. The thought being that in order to do um, good genetic research, the larger the database, um, the better it is to get results um, um, uh, regarding issues about the human genome. So their policy in 19, uh, I'm sorry, their, their policy in 2007 uh, was to uh, create two types of database. One would be an aggregate open access database that would be openly available to a wide range of investigators via a public website. And they would also keep a de-identified genomic data available as controlled access data to authorize um, investigators. However, at about that time, investigators demonstrated that it is possible in principle to identify an individual from a large data set of pooled genomic data. Essentially, and the NIH had assumed that aggregated um, data could not be manipulated in order to identify individuals participating in a particular gen genomic research study. However, when they um, obtained um, the results of these previous investigators who said that in theory, the identified um, samples could still be linked back to the individuals, the NIH quickly restricted access to the pool genomic data from the open access portion of this database. So essentially, this public website um, had now become private, and they also enhanced confidentiality protections for the controlled access database. Several weeks ago, uh, the NIH issued a draft uh, genomic data sharing policy, and they made a request for public comments. A copy of this um, draft sharing policy is in the recommended readings. And again, they want to establish two types of databases. One would be an open access, and the other would be a restricted act access database. Um, now the issue is, how do you assure confidentiality, especially with, it, with this open access database? There are three ways one could go about this. One could say that confidentiality is guaranteed as best as possible, uh, um, or, or maybe in addition, one could um, state that there are legal protections for any breaches of confidentiality, or simply, one could just simply admit the inherent identifiability of genetic data and just say, uh, what it is, um, and we'll, um, in one of our exercises or discussion forum, we'll compare the uh, different um, approaches of um, uh, different biobanks uh, in, in, in what they guarantee to potential participants. Now I would like to talk more about biobanks, which really involves the prospective collection of tissue samples. Biobanks um, essentially involves samples collected for storage in a large biorepository or biobank to be used for unspecified future research. Uh, examples of biobanks uh, are shown in this slide, the Genetic Alliance Biobank, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and then the UK Biobank, which is recruiting um, uh, large numbers to donate blood and urine samples for long-term storage. Um, this slide shows um, the example of a more public biobank. Um, there's a um, personal genome project in the US that has now 
um, also transition to the UK. And this biobank is asking for volunteers to submit their samples uh, that will be um, somewhat um, more um, um, public. Um, and it's, um, um, it's operates on the basis of open consent, which means that almost um, that, which means that all medical information attached to a person's record will be made available for anyone to see online. There are no identifiers that are made publicly, but there is no guarantee uh, that uh, these results cannot be identifiable. Uh, and, and because of that, the project is controversial. Uh, because while people's names and addresses will not appear on the records as standard, again, um, because it could be potentially identifiable, um, the potential participants are warned explicitly that they could easily be identified and that their privacy cannot be guaranteed. So what about the um, other types of biobanks? And this slide shows the ad for the UK Biobank, improving the health of future generations. So the issue is, what kind of informed consent should be obtained for the prospective collection of samples? And the, um, the issue here is that we're asking people to provide consent to future unspecified research. So one could get what's called specific consent, in which the consent uh, states that future research will be done on the disease that is the focus of the current study. Or one could obtain broad consent, like the UK Biobank and other biobanks, simply saying that these samples will be used in any type of research investigating any type of illnesses. The problem sometimes with this type of broad consent is that uh, do participants know that uh, future research um, could involve HIV research or mental illness research or other types of research that could potentially harm communities or individuals if the samples um, become identified. Or one could advocate for a tiered consent in which um, there would be a menu of options whereby participants could indicate whether they want research only done on their um, 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 illness or whether it's okay to do it on a broad range of illnesses. So what are participants' actual choices? Well, one study aimed to assess participants' actual choices regarding future use of biological samples. Um, this study involved um, over a thousand consent forms from the NIH Clinical Center. Um, and um, they asked, uh, these um, uh, consent forms asked participants about their desires. Only 7% declined all future research. 91% said they would give consent to future research on the same condition that was the focus of the study. And 87% only a slightly lower number um, uh, um, provided consent to future research on any condition. So this study showed that most research participants authorize the unlimited future use of their biological samples. Another study um, in, uh, involving cancer clinical trials uh, required consent to store and use samples left over from the clinical trials for future research, and approximately 90% consented to future unspecified use. Uh, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey Study, obta which obtained information on health and nutritional status, uh, also involving interviews and collection of uh, um, samples uh, for DNA analysis. analysis. Um, two consent forms were used for the collection of these samples. One was a consent form authorizing for non-genetic research, and another consent form for future unspecified genetic research. And the results are shown in this slide. And we see, on, on a whole, 
consent for genetic uh, unspecified research were slightly less than the consent obtained for non-genetic um, research, and there were no differences based on any of these characteristics that we see in this column. So many commentators have uh, proposed a binary model, which consists simply of either refusing research or agreeing to broad and future consent for unspecified conditions. With confidentiality safeguards, uh, including the identification of the samples, establishing rules for relinking the identified samples, and also establishing security measures to minimize unauthorized access to the data. Also included in this model would be that there would be IOB approval of new studies and individuals could withdraw their consent at any time. However, uh, uh, many commentaries um, dis disagree with the institution of a solitary binary model. Um, for example, one study involved a focus group eliciting the perspectives of the public on informed consent for biobanking. And while 48% preferred a blanket consent, 42% wanted researchers to ask for their consent for each additional future research study. And 10% favored a menu-like consent regarding on the type of future study. So it appears that a binary model is not going to work for all individuals. Another question, can informed consent ever be waived for prospectively collected blood samples? The short answer is probably no. Uh, and the reason why I say that is um, several years ago, uh, several states were routinely uh, collecting DNA samples for government biobanks. Um, and when parents found out about that, uh, they weren't happy. Essentially, um, the um, blood spots being collected for routine newborn screening was also being stored in data banks. Uh, and the question was, should researchers in biobanks acquire parental consent for the use of a child's newborn screening blood for future research. So is this existing data or prospective um, data? The researchers thought that this was a existing data. Um, however, the intent to collect, to do future spec unspecified research uh, was, was there at the time um, of collection, and hence it really should be considered prospective data and not existing data. And what happened uh, with this um, collection of newborn screening blood samples for uh, future unspecified research um, in Minnesota and Texas, um, parents filed complaints against the state health department. In Minnesota, the court dismissed the lawsuit, but in Texas, uh, the uh, court system ruled in favor of the parents, and they um, said that the state has to post online the research projects and um, um, inform the parents of the lawsuit about how their child's uh, uh, samples were used, and they had to destroy over four million samples that they had obtained without parental consent. So what is the role of um, IRBs with um, genetic research? And this regards mainly what, what information is needed in the informed consent forms. Uh, and we're uh, looking at the prospective collection of samples. So this slide shows the specific additional elements of informed consent that's needed for a genetic um, study. One information is needed on whether or not subjects will be recontacted to provide informed consent for each new study that will be performed on the blood samples. Uh, what are the adverse 
consequences of a breach of confidentiality, for example, loss of insurance or employment? How long will the blood samples be stored? Whether or not the subjects will be recontacted regarding uh, any future research findings relevant to the health? Whether subjects may withdraw the samples from future research at any time? And whether subjects will share in any profits that might result from any commercial product derived from the samples? And also, are there any limits on the future use of the samples, for example, to a uh, particular institution, other investigators, other areas of study, or perhaps um, to another country? One study uh, investigated what was being um, included in um, consent forms approved by the IRB. Um, and this uh, uh, study showed that uh, consent forms um, included, almost all of them included the extent to which confidentiality can be maintained in future research. Um, but the uh, numbers drop down below, as we see here, um, for issues with um, for disclosure of information regarding whether subjects may withdraw the samples, um, whether there will be a separate consent uh, for a collection um, and storage and future use of the tissue samples. Um, also, only 69% of the consent forms stated whether the subjects will be recontacted with, regarding research findings relevant to the health. Um, and Again, lower numbers for uh, whether there'll be any limits on the future use of the samples, and a much lower number on whether um, subjects may have property interests uh, in gene products derived from, from these blood samples. Another study also looked at um, consent forms, and uh, we see the results in this slide. And we um, see that, um, <clears throat> again, uh, many of the consent forms were deficient in providing uh, information um, to the uh, participants. Um, for, uh, for example, while the consent forms, again, did a good job in dis discussing confidentiality protections, um, however, less than 50% mentioned any um, social or psychological risks associated with um, breaches and confidentialities. Only 70% of the consent form mentioned uh, that withdrawal of stored samples would be allowed. Only 64% mentioned anything about whether participants would receive um, uh, um, results of, of their um, genetic testing. And only 53% mentioned anything uh, about whether participants could share in the commercial um, profits derived from their samples. So on the issue on whether individual research results and incidental findings from genetic research should be returned to the participants, uh, this has been a big issue in the last uh, few years. Um, uh, a study done several years ago uh, asking IRBs um, why uh, uh, it was stated in the consent forms that there would be no disclosure back to the research participants. The reasoning of the IRBs are shown in this slide. Uh, one, IRBs thought that the meaning of the results would be unclear to the um, participants because we're dealing with genetic information and that's difficult, so-called it's difficult to understand. Um, they thought that the um, results from the ge genetic research would not confer a benefit. They thought that these tests were experimental. Um, um, also, they thought that um, keeping it um, uh, non-disclosed would actually provide protection uh, for the um, participants. Uh, and if the data were to be de identified, then obviously it would be impossible to report the research back to the um, participants. Um, other reasons included privacy implications for family members who did not provide um, uh, consent for the samples. 
However, the practice of not giving individuals the results of genetic research is changing. Many commentators now argue that there are legal ethical obligations to give results under certain circumstances and conditions. And this is shown in this slide. Um, uh, reasons include um, that the um, uh, associated risk for the, the disease, the risk of contacting the disease is significant. Um, um, or when the disease has important health or significant reproductive implications, um, uh, making decisions about um, future uh, reproductive choices, or when proven therapeutic or preventative interventions are available. I might also add that there is a current of thought that even when uh, no therapeutic options exist for the uh, participants that these results should still be given back to the participants because they have a right to know. What about the issue of um, ownership? Who owns the tissues in, in, a, in a research study? The participant, investigators, or the institution? What happens when a patented invention derived from tissue samples from human research subjects is commercialized? Do participants also own the patent? Are participants entitled to share in the financial benefits that the um, patent yields? Do participants have a right to prevent the use of their body fluids or tissues in the development of patented inventions and or commercialized products? We'll uh, th discuss several of the um, uh, legal cases that have been brought to court in, in our discussion forum. Essentially, the status quo now is reflected in the following uh, uh, paragraph that is included in most informed consent forms. Discoveries made with your DNA samples may be patented by us and the universities. These patents may be sold or licensed, which could give a company the sole right to make and sell products or offer testing based on the discovery. Royalties may be paid to us the university and the sponsor, it is not our intent to share any of these possible royalties with you. We'll discuss more about that in the discussion forum for now. Thank you very much for listening.